Hey folks, take a trip to the virtual outback in rural Australia, a new high quality environment pack now available on the marketplace. The assets are from the spectacular Memories of Australia short film created by Andrew Svonberg Hamilton. Explore the collection of photogrammetry based content captured on location in Australia and download it for free from the marketplace. And speaking of free marketplace products, in honor of Earth Day and this beautiful planet we live on, we've released five new Quixel Megascans collections featuring foliage from a variety of biomes. Download them all and start planting your own environments. When pandemic restrictions forced a planned exhibition to go digital, Kengo Kuma and Associates teamed up with game dev company Historia and rose to the occasion with Multiplication, a physically impossible interactive architectural visualization that anyone can experience online. Head to the feed to uncover how they invited the whole world to their stunning experience. Did you miss our webinar on the new Automotive Configurator Sample Project? Well, now you can learn how to build your own interactive digital showroom on demand. The full video is available now on our YouTube channel. Explore, adapt, and survive in Returnal, a narrative-driven roguelike from Housemark. Read our interview on the feed to discover how the studio's history of creating frenetic, arcade-inspired games has been key to creating the next thrilling AAA exclusive for PlayStation 5. Digital twins are shaping the future of architecture, engineering, and construction. Explore what they are and how they'll help us build better cities with AEC influencer Fred Mills, together with experts from Microsoft, Build Media, and Epic Games in the next episode of The Pulse on Wednesday, May 5th. Register today! And next week, from April 26th to 28th, many folks from the Epic team, including Epic CTO Kim Library, VP of Digital Humans Technology Vladimir Mastelovich, and VP and GM of Unreal Engine Mark Petit, will be speaking at the real-time conference on a variety of topics from metahumans, virtual production, collaborative workflows, and more. Pop over to realtimeconference.com to see the full lineup of sessions and register. Now to give thanks to our top weekly karma earners, these rock stars are Every Nun, Clockwork Ocean, Ugmo, Mickey, Crew Dimer, Shadow River, Maki Girl, Chief Man, Nacho Monkey 2, and Jack Franzen. First up in our community spotlights, you may remember 2019 Epic Mega Jam winner Escape Velocity. The team has gone on to refine it into Orbitarian. Match against your friends or team up in a fast-paced, action-packed space fight set in orbits across the solar system. Use skills, collect shards, and kick your friends to outer space. Download Orbitarian from Steam. Next up, enjoy a short film inspired by the Sicilian legend of Cola Pesce, the son of a fisherman who disappeared into the sea to prevent Sicily from sinking. Visit chrisador.com to watch the full film and see more of the gorgeous work from their team. And last up, enjoy Northern Lake by Matthias Kurzels, their first personal project in Unreal Engine. It's an impressive start and we look forward to more creations from Matthias. Head over to their ArtStation page to get all the details on the project. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hey everyone, and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and today I have members of the MetaHuman Creator team with me. Let me please introduce Alexander Popov. Hey everyone. We got Chris Evans. How's it going? I should probably get my notes up so that I can properly read your titles as well. <laughs> um, alongside alongside uh, Chris Evans, we also have James Golding. Hi, good evening. Uh, technical director, and uh, Nina Ward, product manager. Hey, bro. And just to make sure that we get everyone's introduction correct, Alexander Popov is the art director, and uh, Chris Evans is the lead technical animator. Uh, welcome to Inside Unreal. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about MetaHuman Creator, which is now available out in early access. If you haven't seen it yet, the link is pasted in the form announcement post. You can go ahead and sign up for or request early access um, access to use the demo. Um, I'm not going to do much of the talking today, so I would like to hand it over to Chris. 
Hey, uh, we just wanted to kind of go over the initial inception, if you will, of MetaHuman Creator and spend a couple minutes on that. Um, we've been working together with Three Lateral and Alexander and Vlad and others there for many, many years across many different projects. Um, there was the projects like uh, working on Senua with um, with that team and working on uh, Siren and Andy Circus and a lot of the digital human din demos that we've done uh, with Ninja Theory. So we have really created uh, one of the, I think, best teams in the industry for digital humans but it it takes all of all of us working in the same direction to create one of these high fidelity humans and a goal that we really wanted to hit was allow anybody that uses the engine to create a super high fidelity digital human and that was kind of like a <laughs> a moon landing for us a couple of years ago, we we set out and we said, you know, what what do we need to do to try to enable all UE4 users to create? We we were doing Andy uh, Circus's performance at the time for this GDC demo. I was talking with Alexander and others, and I mean, we we're rigging like individual nose hairs and things like super super high fidelity character, but we really wanted to enable anybody to do that. And three lateral has really focused over the years on kind of a scan to rig pipeline. How can we create rigs as fast as we can at the highest fidelity possible? So we were all talking and we'd worked on so many projects together. We said like, well, we think it's possible that we can take the existing infrastructure at three lateral and wrap it in a way that can allow Unreal Engine users to really create a super high fidelity character very, very easily. And at the time when Vlad was talking about it, um, kind of these markers to move the face around and, and fit the face to what you want and the call and response of when you pull on a kind of an ear, it anatomically forms uh, using anatomy, to like some kind of plausible uh, ear. That was kind of magic. I remember sitting in the room when he was describing that to execs and they were just like, oh, so it's kind of like putty or <laughs> it's just very hard to to understand that you know, you're going to make a movement and it's going to look up into a really huge learned database of, of different anatomical facial features and give you some kind of anatomically plausible, believable response. Um, but yeah, uh, in now years later, it was really great to be able to show the world uh, what the teams have been working on. And um, if... I, there was a time when a little bit of the, the background was shown when Vlad worked with James on a GDC demo that he could talk about a little bit, just getting the groundwork in the engine for... Yeah, this, for this was a while ago, and it was interesting going back and looking at that video. Actually, I hadn't watched it in a long time, but um, I worked with Vlad on a demo for GDC 2017, uh, which was just very early showing this sort of technology of like combining regions of faces. And there was a very small number of faces. There was no one on surface editing, but... Um, you know, Vlad had some things that they needed in the engine, and I added some features. And we worked together on the demo. Worked with some um, a UI artist at at Epic to show something. And so that was just sort of the beginning of this idea of like, oh, you can make a unique face and then animate it and make a whole, you know, get an idea of how you can take even a small database and by using this this sort of mixing tech that that Three Lateral had been developing. But it's really interesting to see how long it takes to go from a prototype into something that you can really give to people and give to everyone. And it's been interesting to, to you know, have been there at the beginning of that journey, working with through lateral on demos, you know, like um, the kite demo that we did many years ago, you know, they were involved in that and so forth. So um, but all the way through to, um, to something we can give to everyone. It's It's been a very uh, interesting, sometimes challenging journey. Uh, but yeah, it just sort of goes to show that, that none of this stuff is easy. There's been a lot of interesting challenges along the way. But yeah, it's good to look back and see that the overall arc of it at this point. And I would say at all times, the three lateral team, especially since they have the expertise when it comes to creating digital faces and things like that, Alexander has been pushing for, you know, how does the user use the the UX? How, how mm. does this workflow work? I remember the 2017 video. I think, Alex, you had called it like shopping for body parts. It's like, you know, little icons and you blend in a little bit of this ear. And it was really the vision of on the three lateral side to have something where you can really feel like you're sculpting, feel like you're working. 
you have to keep taking your eyes off what you're making and you know you do a bit more of that eye and then all the other ones go back yeah, it's, it's not it's not a good way to work but it just goes to show it's not just about having really interesting technology and the ability to render that that technology but you've got to think about the whole pipeline i think that's where three lash will have really put their experience of not just being a technology company but being a content creation company and a company that's worked with so many different um uh, other game studios that they sort of understand the diversity of needs and and that there was a, a clear need for this but in order for it to be um actually meet those needs there, there was a lot that needed to be done so um yeah it's been really interesting uh, i think the other thing is it's been a very collaborative you know just like we were saying that, that it's a mix of a lot of different disciplines so like, i've had to learn an awful lot about both the artistic side, all these terms, you know, lacrimal fluid and all these, you know, really technical terms, which are really interesting, like the details you have to get into around, you know, how the meniscus of fluid in the eye moves as the eyeball moves around, you know, just real detailed stuff. Um, all the way on the other side to sort of cloud technology of like, how do you scale in the cloud and manage a, a fleet of servers? That's stuff that I, you know, I coming from developing games for console. It's a very different experience. So we've, I think everyone on the, the team has learned a lot over the last couple of years. It's been really fun to see the reaction from everyone as well. Like you kind of say technical terms like, you know, meniscus fluid and stuff, but there are people who aren't even particularly familiar with sclera or like some kind of more slightly basic terms, but um, it just kind of shows how broad this, the audience has, has actually been with this as well, which I think really speaks to how intuitive the whole tool is. And it is only just the beginning, in a sense. Mm. So, so, should we jump into it? Yeah. So, I think Alex, <laughs> are, you, are you good to uh, to give us a bit of a demo? Sure. Yeah. So, so Alex has probably Let's been using go. this tool longer than anyone. Um, so uh, we'll let him uh, show how a how a pro does it. You're good to go, Alex. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We can switch. So, I'm running. Uh, a local build for this stream, and I was already fiddling in the background with trying to, to um, create something of, a, of an Abraham Lincoln. But uh, that's actually one point that I would like to connect on, on what Chris and James said. So, so like at this at this point of time, we don't necessarily see MetaHuman Creator as a tool where you uh, try to hit one-to-one -one, uh, likeness. So it's it's more like getting a plausible realistic result out of the already mentioned database which is which is sitting as sort of like uh this this main aspect of, of the meta human creator tool and uh yeah i can yeah let's let's uh, go into a bit of a like a deeper dive so uh the way we envisioned uh but I'll, I'll leave it at, at at the face for now so the way we envisioned how you would approach modeling, because as, as Nina mentioned, so the, the idea was that, that we wanted to cover a really huge range of users from really entry level people, enthusiasts who just want to like play with this without being maybe an, an, an artist who already like worked on faces or whatever to, to all the way to like industry uh, grade users and art artists. So to do that, uh, we developed a system called, which we call uh, Direct Mani Manipulation Tool, uh, DMT, and that is actually at the core of how you uh, edit the face. And we we separated this into like these three panels that uh, I know. I mean, already a lot of people have have uh, played with it. So, so I'm just gonna go quickly through it. So the way we we envisioned that was you either start with a preset, right, or or you can go into blend space and select a couple of presets. Three is like a minimum to enable this, or you can, you can go a higher number than that. And then once you do that, you enable basically uh, blending per region with the characters that you have selected. So you can get really quickly, um, you can quickly blend between the characters and get a like, starting point that you want to continue. Or you can use the, the, the move here, move tab, one second. So the, the move is essentially uh, comprised, it's like a, the sculpt would be the, the mo most uh, granular type of editing that you can do in the meta human creator. And the move would be simply like a, a grouped um, markers so that you can also do a quicker quicker movements and get, get the result quickly before you actually go into, into sculpting. And then you can like refine at a, at a very 
uh, detailed level uh, your, your mesh. But the thing to understand, I guess, about the, the sculpting is, and, and that might be one uh, one of the most important points, is is so unlike ZBrush and other softwares, like so, you're not you're not just moving um, like a, a, a part of mesh, right? And 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 in you know, a in a linear way, you're actually what Chris mentioned. You're you're moving through this RBF space, which means like you're you're moving through the data points of, of all the characters in the database and geometry is trying to actually hit that that spot and that means it th this is something sometimes you will see like especially with the eyes like when you move you're not actually moving only that that marker that, that you selected so the surrounding area moves as well and this is because uh, you're you're so you're getting the the at, 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 uh, at an instant you're getting full rig, full deformations from that particular character that, that you're actually uh, selecting that, that area uh, from. So, so this means uh, it will be very difficult to, to I guess, uh, localize it to, to really small spots. So, so that is why you will, you will notice kind of like uh, some other regions move as well as, as, as you move the markers. And it's, uh, it's essentially, it comes down to, to just um, learn. It, 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 we feel that it is very intuitive, but you, you'll need some, some time to just like Play around and, and notice how how this works, and and going back to the to the lightness that we talked about. So so yes, uh, for now we, we don't intend uh, for the user to be able to like you, you know take a photo and, and like hit the lightness uh, one to one. It's more like we want to to get a, a plausible, a realistic uh, a digital human. You can go like uh, even though like all of the, the the markers that i was mentioning like wh wherever you move them you you will get uh, it is actually a, a data that exists in the database it, meaning it's, it's from a, a plausible um position on of, of the of the geometry from from the database but still you can get unplausible looking characters because essentially like if you um right now they're all, all uh, various ethnicities and genders in the database and so you're like moving through all of them and so you can, you know, uh, especially with the eyes, they're very sensitive. You can create like a maybe Asian-looking eyes, uh, but your your brows would be uh, from a completely different character, and like you would have a, a a big, I guess, difference between the two. So you have to kind of like mindfully move the other one as well, so, so to avoid um, potential uh, unplausibilities, um, unless uh, unless you maybe want to do that, like, and then that is also an artist, artistic choice, I guess. Um, so yeah, that, that would be kind of like a brief uh, cover of, of, of the way you edit the face. And uh, yeah, I can, I can start going maybe category by category and, and just like get, getting a more in-depth uh, uh... Would love to hear it, Alex. Yep, okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually go like from the beginning. Select the preset and just start from that. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. I'm gonna take Alex. Do you have a favorite preset? From the ones? Oh, um, that's a that's a tough question. I guess I, I really <laughs> I, I really I really do like this character. Uh, I felt like when we were creating him, like this sort of a Genghis Khan looking character. That that was the idea. So I like him, and uh, I like Hudson. I think he's very uh, charismatic character. Hudson's quite um, lovable, isn't he? I, I yeah. quite like Sky. Sky is one of my favorites. Yeah, let me see. Just uh, oh yeah, yeah, Sky. Yep, she's pretty awesome as well. I actually like Seneca as well. He has a, an interesting oh, yeah. head shape. Uh, but okay, let's let's maybe take I don't know Tor. Doesn't matter. Um, so you'll notice, in, in my personal preference, I like to set up uh, like the background col color, which you can find here in the lighting and uh, lighting settings. I, I, it, this might actually even be been missed by people. I, I'm not sure like uh, whether on the UA side is, is is clear enough. But yeah, so you can select the background and kind of like find a complementary color, like a painter would do, and just it, it makes uh, I guess the, the experience a bit more uh, enjoyable. And um, okay, so let's let's start doing something. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe try and, and age these characters. So so I'm gonna 
select some of the older characters from the presets. Let's see, maybe take this lady. Can take her as well. Uh, who else? Uh, maybe a male character as well. All right. So let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something about the eyes. So maybe select some point between here. I'm going to deflate the lips a little bit. Let's see the nose. I'd like it to be bigger, a little bit bigger, but I may do that in the sculpting. Uh, enlarge it a little bit ears as the character gets older. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I like this. Like that. The jaw, jawline. No, I think I'm going to keep it as is. It's a forehead. All right. I'm going to switch back to the move. Or actually, I can go directly to Scott. I want to address the jaws a little bit. Just Alex, while slow. you're uh, operating here, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. We're getting a load of them, so we're going to have to start a little sooner in the Q&A, if that's OK. Sure, yep, uh, fine by me. MR3D Dev was wondering, will there, be an, will there ever be an offline MetaHuman creator? That's, a, that's an interesting question. I think it's we can certainly see why that would be desirable you know building obviously what this looks like when you first see it is a is a character creator from games now what it's doing is quite different than what normally a character creator in a game is doing because we're creating brand new rigs um into uh mixing from this database and so forth so it's a very different proposition to put this into a game um so i think it's a really interesting question i think it's something that i can understand why people would want to do um it's something that we have been talking about, but there are some big problems. I mean, the reason that this is a cloud-based application right now is we have this big database of, of faces as we've talked about. We also have a big database of the facial textures. Um, these are, these are, those are big and they're going to get bigger. Um, so there's, that's really the big challenge. It's like, how, how could we possibly in the future make something which is small enough that would ship with a game? Um, so we, we just don't know at the moment. It's going to be something that we're going to look at. We, we, we hear the need, we hear the question, um, but it's not going to be happening, you know, next week or anything. So we've got a lot of R&D to do there. Next question comes from Will Voss, who's wondering, how do you paint textures on MetaHuman's faces? There are three albedos. How is that supposed to work? Chris, can you take that one? I'm guessing it's three albedos for the, like, blood flow maps. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there are a lot of different textures that comprise of a metahuman face, but um, there's kind of the main... So what, what Alexander was just showing, uh, we call that kind of texture synthesis when you're building the skin that you want uh, in the tool. And when you're creating your character in MetaHuman Creator, you are... So I'll get a little bit technical because mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of game devs in the audience that might be interested. But basically, um, we have a kind of machine learning backend that breaks out the high frequency from the low frequency detail. Uh, what that allows you to do is completely change and rework complexion, but still you'll notice when he had moved through the high frequency details, that allows us to use those normal maps uh, and things, but mix them to make an, a new skin. Uh, and allow you to do some pretty big changes to it. The reason why we kind of keep that high frequency is because it's a real challenge to use machine learning to generate new normal maps. Um, you know, a lot of character artists know you can't even really trans transform a normal map 90 degrees if you're a, a, a purist. Um, so having the high frequency and low frequency um, broken apart, that then gets sent down to you as a new albedo that's synthesized from that, but then it knows the high frequency that it picked and it does the tool does some special things like it will automatically change the tangents of the face you've made to better fit with the high frequency normal map that has been chosen. 
because we saw kind of early on that if we tried to place a normal map or people know if you if you bake a normal map for a face shape that it it wasn't baked against um, if you use that normal map it'll start looking puffy because the mesh tangents are now different and the normal map is expecting the mesh tangents that were there when it was baked so we go ahead and we change the high frequency detail of the face mesh as well to match the high frequency detail of the normal map and then all of the driven wrinkles use that those same high frequency details and what we call kind of blood flow maps, which are very, very tiny, um, kind of diff driven diffuse. So I think that's probably what you're talking about is the, the driven diffuse, which is kind of like the redness of the face. Um, but there's also multiple normal maps, and those are driven by the rig as well. Um, these masked regions in the face shader that we're talking about they're driven by the face rig live because the face rig runs live in the engine and is not baked out. Um, the face rig talks to that material uh, for the face shader and it blends the appropriate wrinkle areas from like 96 different zones in uh, as you play an animation or create your animation or interact with the face in Unreal. So that's a quick overview <laughs> of why there are so many maps. Um, but yeah, there's, there's um, yeah, that's a quick overview. Thanks, Chris. Um, next question comes from Leftwich DE, who's asking, will the clothing section be improved as well? I can talk about clothing. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, we'd like to add uh, clothing. Uh, the clothing that you that you see in MedHuman Creator. So there are 18 different body types, um, but then across those different body types, so that, that's you know masculine, feminine, um, three different heights and three different BMIs, and across those there's then four different LODs, and because we don't really know what LOD you're going to see, some games can auto LOD out and copy over skinning. Uh, because they know the distance that you'll see a character at. Because we have no idea how you're going to use these characters in your game, we really tried to hand author all lots and skin all lots. And that was a real challenge. Um, all in all, the, the, the very limited clothing set that you're seeing is, um, is over a thousand different skinned and imported assets into Unreal Engine. As you start downloading different characters, if you look at the folder structure that's being built in your project you'll start noticing uh, some common items and uh, which are which which items you'll start noticing different um, all of the things that I just spoke about like you'll you'll notice that there's per BMI clothing per height clothing we tried to sim all of the clothing folds for most of the garments across every different BMI so uh, I think with the exception of like the hoodie but that the clothing shouldn't look like it's just the same clothing re um, warped to fit a, a new character. It's important to us that it that the clothing feels good and, and fits the different characters. Um, but yeah, so there's more clothing to be coming in the future. And the a great thing about MediHuman Creator is that we're not really tied to engine releases. Uh, you download your characters through Bridge. Uh, we're going to figure out what our next update cadence is, but you won't be having to wait for a new version of Unreal to get new clothing. It should just, um, you should just see it uh, show up, and I'm sure we'll put some messaging out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've, we've been patching cool. MetaHuman Creator, I think every day since we released. It's just been small things, small fixes and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's it's really great that we can we can get get uh, updates out really fast and do things more than just bug fixes. And Alexander, feel free to uh, interrupt us whenever you would like to comment. Um, we're, we're, we're watching you here. Sure, sure. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of like get, getting a, a feel of this live stream, so, so sorry for uh, <laughs> being quiet. But no, yeah. you're, you're good. Next question. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, no, sorry. Please proceed. Next question comes from Entrillion1. Um, will the 3D models be compatible with other engines, for example, Godot and Unity? Nina, do you want to do that one? <laughs> yeah, I can say that one. Um, so 
Metahumans are for use in Unreal Engine. Um, we'll allow you to take them into other places like Maya, but um, you will need to render them um, or publish them with Unreal Engine in order to comply with our end user end user license agreement. Easy enough. Sir Voxlot is wondering, is it possible to transfer a DNA file from one mesh to another? I'm not quite sure what that means. I don't know either. <laughs> Verbatim. Perhaps Sorry. Sir Voxlot can uh, detail. Also, for all you out there that are watching, we're getting a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we will not be able to cover all of them. If you want to continue the discussion once we go offline, the forum announcement post that exists on the event section of our of the Unreal Engine forums is where you can continue the conversation um, afterwards, and we can potentially chime in with some answers there as well. I can uh, I can take a quick swing at that one, but but so basically, when you build a character in the engine, it depends how advanced this guy is, but so. Um, there's a DNA file in the engine, but it's built into the file structure. So maybe you saw that on GitHub or something. With Maya, we send a DNA file down. The DNA file basically says, for this configuration of joints and blend shapes on this face, when I move this control, what's the response? When I do this, what's the response? Because each character has a different blended response. Um, so it wouldn't make sense to use the uh, same DNA file on a new character unless that new character had the exact same face or so. So I'm not super sure if I answered the question, but that's the relationship of the DNA file to the character's head. I can just add a little bit more detail there. That's, that's a good point, Chris, that just in terms of the technical details. So when you download a metahuman skeletal mesh from this tool, uh, embedded into the skeletal mesh, just like Chris says, there is this this DNA data, which controls how, just like Chris says, the controls affect it. Um, that's used by um, what's called Rig Logic. This is a new plugin that shipped to standard with 426, and this is based on you know all of Three Laterals experience around building face rigs. That's what drives these rigs live in the game. And so you place a Rig Logic node inside Control Rig, and that looks up in the skeletal mesh what the the DNA, the the the, the mapping driving data is, and then we'll use that data. So there is something kind of you know, generally the assets we give you are just sort of plain Unreal assets, materials, textures. It's very intentional that there's no magic in these materials that you, that you can open them all up and mess with them. The only sort of um, uh, special thing is is this DNA data inside the skeletal mesh. And currently the only way to author that is using MetaHuman Creator because just like Chris says, it's very tied to the face. You couldn't, if you change the face, you'd have to change that data. It's, it's all coupled um, and not an easy thing for people to do. It really needs all of the pipeline. Thank you all. Uh, Alexander, are you good with us continuing to do some questions here? Or is there anything you want to go over? If, if you guys are fine, uh, I'm, I'm good, good to, for you to go with the questions, and then I'll, I'll chime in uh, at one point. Is I'm that enjoying fine? you kind of. Yeah, through, yeah, it's great. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm finding it a bit hard well. to, to focus on the, on the questions. And while I'm doing some, just trying to get a hold of it. And then once I'm, I'm good, I'll, I'll ping you guys if, if that's fine by you. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you, Alex. Uh, next question comes from Player Chas, uh, who's wondering about body sculpting. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a really interesting one. Um, it, it's obviously something that we would we would like to do, and something we've talked a lot about. Again, there are some really big challenges with body sculpting. Um, like Chris said, right now we have these preset body types, and we've we've manually gone and, and created the clothing and all the correctives for each body type. So it's a huge amount of work, but it's the only way that we can make it, you know, really hit the quality bar we want for, for all the different body shapes. The probably the biggest challenge with sculpting a body, <clears throat> well first of all we need to build a database and figure out similar to what the face took. And remember it took a long time to get to this point with faces, a lot of research, a lot of iteration. So there's all that work to do to figure out if and how this would apply to bodies. But then clothing is a huge challenge on top of that. How do you you know, if you've got complete control over the body, how do you make sure the clothes look good on that body? And that's just something we simply don't have an answer to at the moment. So it's a really interesting question, something we'd love to do. But again, some really big questions that we're going to have to to get into there. <clears throat> and on top of that, we also need to think about um, retargeting animations. We're going to want to make sure the same animation can run on on all of those you know variable body types. So uh, that's something that's you know being worked on for UE5. Um, but those are probably the clothing and and retargeting are probably the big the big topics that we're going to need to uh, to tackle. Even once we've solved the big challenge of of sculpting a body and what that would actually look like, would it be handles like the face? So yeah, some really big questions there. Um, but I think it's something that we will be we will be thinking about. And then um, I don't know if 
asked a question. Uh, I just wanted to chime in that mm -hmm. because we're delivering source files, you can mm. download the source file. You could make changes to the body because it doesn't have as many deformers and um, things as the face. Uh, basically, if you were to click off of the clothing, you could download your MetaHuman um, and it's going to have the source files and you could build a spacesuit around your MetaHuman. Or That's why we give you the deforming skeleton that's needed to export your body and bring it into to Unreal Engine. Next question comes from LeftwitchD again, who's asking, will we be able to make colorful, colorful hair like purple? Right now we're restricted to the blonde and black spectrum. Yes, is this very short answer. We're gonna- <laughs> Like it, next we question, let's go. Yeah, let's keep going. Yeah, yeah. I, don't I, I, I'm don't when, we get but yeah. Don't know don't when, um, hoping soon, but um, yeah, it'll be- it's On a big long list, yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> on our growing list of things to add. I guess um, not a question from chat, but something that we might want to. Is there a public roadmap or a plan for a public roadmap uh, in terms of MetaHuman? Um, no, uh, we might do at some point, but uh, we we kind of want to see what people are telling us first and get a sense of what the the bigger buckets are for what we could be looking at. But once we get those, we might show something, but it will be all hypothetical. Um, so none of it will be definite until it's actually out into the world. I think. Something that's so exciting about this product versus other things is like there's nothing really like this out there. So it's not like we can. It's not like a set ex, set of expectations. We could take this in so many different directions, and so that's why getting to this point was such a big deal for the team because now we get to see well what are people doing with it, what are the the most important things people are are finding and needing, and then we can kind of respond to that. So we're still very much in the kind of learning phase and listening phase at the moment um, because there's just there's just a lot we can do. Next question comes from Ben Ben Two, who's asking, "Will there be any abilities to extend the metahuman system to create human esque creatures like elves, dwarves, maybe even orcs?" That might be one of those big buckets that we don't want to talk about. <laughs> big bucket. Yeah. No, I, I, it is a really popular request. Like, obviously, a lot of people are really interested in in you know humanoid characters like like the orcs and the elves and and I mean everything in between. So. Um, I, I think there's. Oh, Nina, you just muted. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think there's a big range there as well between you know characters which are just a small tweak on humans, you know maybe a different shaped ear or something, all the way to you know where it just be the same topology but um, but with some adjustments, and then all the way to uh, you know orcs or something where it's a totally different topology. Like it's it's such a broad question. Um, again, it's one of those things where yes, we we definitely hear the interest, but. Um, there's certainly some challenges for us to figure out in terms of how we might even tackle that. I think, I think ultimately we're still pretty focused on humans right now. We kind of want to get to that specific metahumans that you can mm -hmm. have far more control and, and over what you end up with. So that's still going to take a while yet. If anyone that's else, always, there, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say that's always my quick answer with Nina. It's metahuman creator, but um, <laughs> we, we've we heard your we heard the, <laughs> the name. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to take a while to, for us to really n nail this and get it. Um, this is just the initial, you know, uh, release, and there's a bunch of stuff we really want to do to make these not only usable, you know, usable on a lot more platforms and uh, more performantly and things like that. I saw we announced MetaPet Creator like three weeks ago, so I guess we should probably get on with that. Have you started it yet, James? <laughs> uh, right now. I'm typing right now. Okay, get coding faster. Next, up, next question. I see you can do dogs, but can I do a dragon? It's just a dog with wings, you know. That's... <laughs> Remove the feather. If uh, anyone watching knows any orcs or elves out there, let us know so that we can use them for references. That is the other challenge: is finding enough orcs for, to scan for our database. That's definitely definitely a problem. I think they have a few in New Zealand. Next question comes from uh, Formula E, who's asking, can we use metahumans to build character creation systems in our games? I mean, that's kind of the, the point we covered earlier. I think it's, it's a really interesting idea, but there's definitely some big technical challenges to taking this from an, um, an online sort of uh, tool that you use outside the engine uh, or um, to build assets for the engine versus something that you could bring online. I, I think we'll, we'll look into it, um, but we won't know yet how feasible that is until we really get into to solving some of these problems around data size. 
we're definitely receiving more specific questions in terms of like eye colors and different shapes. And I think we've sort of covered that right um, in regards to where we're going in the future. Um, all of that is sort of on the potential roadmap, uh -huh. right? In terms of uh, customization that is available. I remember the tools early access, what is it now? A week, I think, a week and one day uh -huh. <laughs> that has been uh, available to the public. So um, tune in to the Unreal Engine Twitter handle as well as the Unreal Engine forums. Uh, we have created a MetaHuman section there. If not, it will be online real soon. Um, we have one. Thanks. I've been there. Okay. It's there. Okay. Awesome. Um, been busy doing the live stream of MetaHuman. I haven't had enough time to play with the tool myself yet. Um, all right. Let's move on. Uh, next question comes from Naman Arshad, who is asking, will support for 3D softwares other than Maya be introduced anytime in the future? I could take that. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, so um, our company has used Maya to develop all of the the backend pipeline, uh, everything. Um, not hating on other softwares, uh, but it's just there's a lot going on um, under the hood with the Maya plugin that we released, and it would be a real challenge uh, to figure out how to get that working in other softwares. So, like uh, a great example is. Um, if if you've done a lot of rigging and animation in like Blender, Studio Max, or Maya, you know Maya has like a joint orient matrix, and that doesn't even exist in Max. So there's just some stuff, um, and like Blender requires a bone length, which Maya doesn't. There's there's a quite a few things where the softwares just do them completely differently, and we'd be chasing ourselves. We'd be spending all of our time trying to get that working instead of actually improving the the tool. But uh, that that's kind of but it, you know, it'd be great to see in the future um, what people what people do if if people figure out ways to author. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, Chris, do you think that's something that like course? a community effort to make a Blender version or something would would that be plausible, or is it just that's that's just not going to happen? Um, anything is possible. Anything is possible. <laughs> I mean, we uh, I have to check about the actual plugin code, but I mean, we're very transparent with things. Mm -hmm. We I think we could make available what is needed to, to do it, but it would be a real challenge because like I said, the softwares are just very, very different. Mm -hmm. We're not even talking about handedness, we're just talking about representation mm -hmm. of blend shapes, joints, uh, different things like that. I think the other thing was like, we, we wanted to open up to Maya so that, you know, so people can animate their metahumans. Um, like for most other stuff, it's, it's really kind of taking it into engine and, and um, going from there. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Nina. And and also, you know, we would rather, you know, we're we're still a, a limited development team. I know it seems like Epic's a big company, but you know, the team on doing writing the code for this was surprisingly small. And you know, we're trying to focus also on animating inside the engine. We'd really like that to be a plausible place for people to do a lot of their work. Um, and you know, rather than having to split our effort between different three D packages, if we can do it in just one place and and make it available to everyone, that's that seems like a really exciting way to to focus our efforts. And and I also just want to say, there's so much that goes into it. The, <laughs> the delivering source files was really not the easiest thing, but it was very, very important to the team. And um, there were a lot of people involved, like Nicola, Vladimir K, uh, Voya. Like there was a team of people really working to get source assets right. And when you're watching this, like you know, this this bar creep across the screen for three minutes while it's generating a Maya file from scratch. The team is doing a lot of stuff. Uh, the, we're, we're making sure DirectX is the renderer that you've set in Maya. We're building a DirectX shader that has all of the wrinkle map blending and everything. Um, there was so much. There was a lot that went into setting up the Maya file properly uh, to work with all LODs and all rig logic and everything. But we're really proud that we were able to give that out because that's really powerful uh, and will allow people to kind of reverse engineer stuff if they want to, or you know, like I said, build a space suit around the character. Um, there's also the UE4 RBF solver plugin is installed by um, by Quixel. So when you're skinning your character, I mean, you're able to look at the driven joints of that character for your clothing the same way that the joints look in the engine using our pose driver. So there's a lot of work went into the source files and it's really awesome to be able to give that out. But again, like that's a whole nother plugin that would need to be kind of written for these files to work in another DCC app. Thanks for the clarifications. 
Next question comes from CNorth, who is asking, any plan to be able to import scan data into MetaHuman? That's an interesting one. I, I don't know um, at the moment. It's, uh, uh, I think it's another one of those ones that we need to, to look into. I, there's no, there's no uh, you know, nothing we're announcing at the moment. Let's see. Next question comes from Sir Voxelot, uh, who's wondering, where are the dynamic material instances on the head being created and controlled? It seems like it's ticking since it works in editor, even if there's no live link skeleton in the blueprint. Very specific question. Um, I don't remember exactly without digging in, I don't, unless Chris does, but um, those MIDs are going to be driven by the animation system. So, you know, one of the things that um, uh, curves in the Anim Blueprint can do is drive material parameters. So uh, the, the control rig node running rig logic is going to be driving the wrinkle maps, the parameters for the wrinkle maps, and the parameters for the uh, animated albedo blood flow maps. Those will then run as curves through the Anim Blueprint and then drive material parameters. So it'll look to see um, which sections have the parameters and then and then set those. So yeah, it'll be happening in the editor, but it doesn't have to tick. It's just anytime the animation's playing, it's going to be pushing those parameters into the MIDs. I hope that helps. I'm sure Sir Voxel will let us know if it didn't. <laughs> you should. But it's, it's a standard feature. Like that's not a new thing. Like we've been, you know, we've done lots of demos over the years, and there's lots of places where you will use animation to drive material parameters and MID. So we didn't write anything special there. Next question comes from Sky, who's wondering. Um, it'd be good to hear what their thoughts are um, on what you think the effect and and or non-effect is to artists and character models are. Um, there are a lot of folks in the community and industry who are sort of wondering about mm. what ripple effects MetaHuman will sort of uh, set off. Maybe Alex has thoughts on that one. Yeah, I can, I can chime in on that. So, so I mean, yeah, we heard a lot of um, different opinions on that, but the, the way we see this is is basically it's, it's supposed to empower artists and everyone else. So uh, being a character artist myself and working for a long time in the in this industry, in the industry, so you have a you're used to uh, I mean having a lot of tedious processes while you create the character right from topology to UV to everything. So so it's it's I mean this this tool is supposed to to help you like jumpstart this this uh, these elements and just allow you to to create. Uh, characters more quickly and, and whether you use it as a, as a starting point and then what was already already mentioned like use it in the other apps to, to on top of it or, or use it as, as, as a finished character or whatever it's it's it is essentially supposed to, to empower you and, and we feel that uh, the creative creativity will still uh, you know be, be uh, recognized in terms of like if you have a, a if you sort of like level the whole field uh, of users and, 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 and elevate them with this tool, uh, you're still going to see different uh, artists using the tool differently and someone will get better results, someone uh, different. So, so I think that nothing essentially changes, just, just you're, you're uh, having a tool that allows you to do things more easily and quickly than, than it used to, to uh, up until this point. So uh, personally, I... I really fell in love with the tool it's it's a bit different i mean uh well i guess what i'm trying to say is like uh if you if you're like a traditional you know sculptor or or anything uh, you you're, you you can still do that in, in in any application but if you're using it in a uh, production environment even in, in uh, uh, and I've, i i believe that artists uh, a lot of artists in the industry right now will agree like you 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 uh when you're working on a project, you start from uh, various assets that were all already prepped, and 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 you know you, you try to to optimize the whole process, anyways. So so the, this MetaHuman creator is, is a tool is supposed to do that like in in one place. And so so I don't know why I understand the the, the concern, but but I think that that happens with any new technology, and and essentially I, I think it it at the end of the day I think it, it will only help. Uh, artists and, and not not cause them to lose their jo jobs. Yeah, you yeah, can they're... you can definitely spot the difference between a professional <laughs> and someone who 
is just kind of tinkering. Like when I get into the tool, I can't get anywhere near what Alex does. Um, yeah. So it, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. it, it definitely helps. I mean, if you if you have knowledge and if you, you uh, all all the skill that you um, gathered while working in whatever uh, way, it, it will all be reflected in the MetaHuman Creator as well. So it's it's no exception. And, and yeah, so so basically, you just uh, get a, a really good head start on on a lot of pro processes. Yeah, and on the other hand, like it does mean I end up with a digital human. It's uh -huh, just yeah. like it's just a digital human, whereas Alex ones are a bit more special. Uh -huh. <laughs> I I also feel like um, it's going to allow people to be more artistic and focus on art. I think that you know there. There was an entire kind of painting genre of people, many more than nowadays, that would really just try to paint an exact human, um, you know. And then when the camera was invented, I mean, that was the explosion of modern art. It was kind of like, okay, well, it's it's a bit easier to make an exact pixel perfect reproduction of a person now. So maybe we can focus on on doing more artistic stuff. Or I've been on enough AAA games to know that you know. <laughs> when the art director wants to kind of noodle specific stuff like a scar on a face or, you know, there's always going to be, I think it'll allow artists to focus more on some, maybe some of the hero characters for now and um, get really high quality characters that are interacting and telling the story uh, and filling in. But, you know, maybe that's just, just my, my take on it. All right, uh, next question comes from Todd Kleinhans, who's wondering, hi, does uh, MetaHuman Creator have the ability to import a reference image? It is not at the moment. Um, that's something that uploading stuff is surprisingly fraught because then you start having to worry about you know, ownership and, and mm -hmm. security and things like that. So um, again, not to say never, but it's not something that's planned at the moment. So try to... Specialize in the second monitor talent. I've seen people use, I can't remember what it's called, Ghost or something, where they can sort of bring an image over the top, which seems to work pretty well. Um, I don't know exactly how that works. I've just seen it on a few videos. Yeah, and Pure Ref as well lets you mm. onion skin something on top. Next question comes from Odeb7, who's asking Can you clarify the symmetry options? Yeah, I can, I can cover that. So. Uh, just give me one second. Okay, so when you go into sculpt, you have the symmetry. So essentially, um, I saw a, a lot of comments uh, uh, in terms of people commenting on, on the like uh, whether char preset characters are like too symmetric and stuff like that. So, so essentially, the whole database that this tool is is comprised uh, of is is based, as mentioned, on scanned characters, which are which are. Uh, digital doubles and completely like asymmetrical to uh, uh, to the extent as as each uh, individual character is. So the the symmetry in the tool is is actually working only on on, on markers, which means uh, if you turn the symmetry on, you're you're moving markers simultaneously, but still like uh, the way we explained how the the the, the whole DMT direct manipulation tool works. So so if I'm selecting and moving. Um, marker at this point and the symmetry is on so so that just means that the marker on the other side is also moving through that same space and just like selecting the part of the character uh, uh symmetrically but but it doesn't not mean that 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 character in the database is is not like he's probably asymmetrical so if i'm i'll try not to, to confuse too much but yeah the, the point is if you turn off the asymmetry you can just Simply move markers independently and get more asymmetrical characters. But but in essence, with the symmetry on, uh, the characters will still be to to an extent of the the digital characters in the database asymmetrical. And for the for the various modes, they're basically relatively self-explanatory. So it means when you're turning off the the, the symmetry and choose like left to right, it'll just uh, copy the markers from one to the other side and. The same goes for for the other, vice versa, and then the average will just do as it says. Uh, it will average and and find the spot there, and then after that, like the, the symmetry is activated, and it acts the same on all three levels. I hope that clarifies. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, that makes sense. 
if 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 um, if I confused by by any chance or something, um, we can follow up on the on the forum later. So so no worries. Thank you, Alex. Um, next question comes from Asin, who's asking: Are those characters meant to be used for games, like a multiplayer shooter, or are they only for cinematic purposes? Oh no, definitely. The, the intention is that they can be used in games. Um, <clears throat> we've worked really hard to uh, make sure you know LODs for all the clothing for all the hair um, I mean Chris will will know I've been banging on about this for for months but you know we tested metahuman sample that the original sample we put out um, across you know uh, all the different devices on you know mobile phones and on switch that's why we have eight levels of detail that's why the hair goes from strands to cards to baked textures in some places or a sort of helmet representation um, we really hope that we're building characters that can scale all the way up to almost movie quality and all the way down to the phone now having said all that i don't think we're done yet i think that you know the groom the strand based hair is is amazing like the the team charles and the rest of the team who've worked on the, the strand based hair it is fun, like phenomenal and i think everyone you know is really excited about using it but it is still really expensive and he has tons of ideas to make that cheaper and, and scale better. It does run on like a uh, you know PS5 and, and Xbox Series X now, um, but we can make that better and that will get better in, in time. Um, and, and I think the same with the materials on the skin. Right now we've, we've had to make a number of cuts in the material when we put it onto mobile. I think we can do better in the way that we maybe pre-bake textures. And so that's, again, something we're gonna be looking at in the future is not just getting it to work on these platforms like it does now. We, we've put a lot of work in to get to this point, but make it really, work well and be really shippable and really efficient uh, on all these different platforms. So that's going to be one of the things we know we're working on next is, you know, as you download these characters over the coming months and years, we're going to be, they're going to be more optimized, more, more um, tightly set up for all the different platforms. But yeah, we absolutely intend these to be usable across lots of different devices. That's been a big effort for the, from the team. I know Chris, if you had anything to add to that. <laughs> all right next question then um comes from rca film productions is wondering is metahuman ever going to give you the ability to make a dig digital representation of an actual person via a photo I, again another really big bucket i i don't think that's gonna come anytime soon if if and if I mean, I don't even know if we will consider that. But yeah, we haven't we haven't really talked that much about that. There's just not enough data in a single photo, I think, to uh, to to get to hit the bar. I mean, you could probably come up with something, but yeah, that's not something that we're planning at the moment. To clarify a little bit on sort of, I'm not going into too much detail, but just could you compare what the difference between like computing a photo versus the actual scan that we're getting that we're, that's being used for MetaHuman? I mean, the process, uh, the, the process for scanning someone that went into this database is, is pretty amazing. Um, I've been lucky enough to go visit the, the scanner in, in, um, in Serbia where they, they've built a lot of this database. And it is, uh, it is pretty phenomenal. Um, but it, it's a lot of cameras and uh, a lot of processing power that goes into it. So uh, you know, the idea is you want a complete model of, of the face from all directions so that you can capture I and mean, you can see the detail in these faces down to the pore level. Um, so you know, that, that's you know, but those are reference images. Now, of course, you could have a much lower res scan, but you still kind of want a 3D representation of the face if you're going to try and fit to it, I would guess. But um, yeah, this is all, these are all open questions. But, you know, a 2D image just doesn't give you the shape, I think, to, um, uh, to try and build a, a, fit a fit a face to. But I know, Chris, if you had any further thoughts on that, or Nina, if you had any thoughts. Um, yeah, what, what you said, like, it would be much easier to fit to, you know, a, a, a some new mesh than to, to some photo the photo stuff is a real challenge um you're able to it's one of these things where you can really get 80 percent of the way super fast so mm -hmm. um you can take a front photo apply it to a face and just use the photo texture and because you have pressed that photo texture onto the 3d model if it's not moving it might look like whoa it looks just like the photo but um the way that these different technologies work, uh, like texture synthesis and all of the shader stuff that I talked about, it just means that it would be very, very hard to generate a person of the quality um, that people expect from metahumans and, and, and from Epic. So yeah, it's a data. A data yeah, yeah how, how you'd get the nose shape and the chin and all that stuff from a, from a single front photo seems, seems hard.
Next question comes from Zeon Cat, who's asking, um, are you planning on making more traditional sliders for more direct um, control of main features in the face instead of always relying on the database? No. <laughs> I'd, um, I guess I guess the question there is is do you struggle to use the the markers like what um, I mean like personally kind of using them I don't find them too difficult to kind of move around like there are maybe some slightly more difficult areas um, like the eyes can be a little bit tricky but um, I don't I don't think we've spoken about sliders before have we. Well, we wanted to get away from sliders. That was the shopping for body yeah. parts. <laughs> but that was that'd be a slider that blends in a specific nose. I mean, the we we call it the direct manipulation tool because it's already very direct. If you're not, you know, we're growing the database, but if you're not able, if you pull a direction and there's no feedback, that means that that hasn't been observed in the database. So, um, it it's not just like we're going to make a blend shape on the fly that lets you pull that way. Uh, you are constrained by the people that have been observed in, on the back end. Next question comes from uh, Retro Game Trip. Um, have you got a full release target that you're aiming for? Sort of, <laughs> but nothing we can really share right now. Sounds good. Next question from Metagrow Fax is wondering, will artists ever be able to bake the character down to a single material material with only one set of textures? Um, I suppose that goes a little bit to what, um, I mean, you could do that now, right? We just give you all the all the base textures in a material and you could take that those textures and composite them in Photoshop or something and then bring them back in and build your own material. So there's nothing to stop you doing that right now. Um, in terms of doing that as part of the automatic process, that is something we are looking at is for, for lower end platforms and just for efficiency, there are certain textures right now which never actually change. Um, if you look in the material, things like the region tints that you can change, those are still done in the material, but we could pre-bake those um, and just have a single texture rather than um, a stack that's being processed in the material. So things like optimizations like that, we are working on. Um, and the same, you know, like I talked about earlier for mobile, where we might want to bake some of those layers of textures down to be more efficient um, because we are limited by texture samplers on mobile. So. I think there will be some of that going on, um, but it was really important to us that the assets that you get are just normal assets. And if there's things you want to do for your project, you know, the MetaHuman is just the starting point and, and you can take that further and apply your own clothes and your own, like Chris said earlier, your own body, and you can mess around with the textures. And, you know, it's really supposed to be this open system where you, you can take this as a starting point and, and, and bake things and manipulate things as you need to. Next question comes from Timo Helmers, who's wondering, do you have uh, do you have plans to unlock the constraints? So this is a little bit on the same topic mm -hmm. of um, the previous one. Do you have plans to unlock the constraints a little bit so we could take it past the morph targets uh, or whatever you're using here and make characters with more extreme features? Nina or Alex? I... Yeah, I can, I Sorry, can Alex, that. go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add, uh, I guess, uh, a bit on, on what Chris was saying previously and, and also connect to this. So uh, the idea is to, to, to keep, at, at least for this mo moment, for, uh, for the MetaHuman creator to be uh, sort of like at, at the uh, realistic and plausible, uh, I guess, uh, barrier. And so uh, this means like, yeah, we could easily do that and, and allow the user uh, to, to, to move the markers beyond the, 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 the points, but then you you get um, the potential to break the rig and everything else uh, in, in place. So, so I, I think, I mean, we have been discussing previously about maybe like having some, you know, um, like control where you just, you can like switch off the, 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 all, the all the mechanisms that can like keep you bound. But uh, but I think it, that's also like a discussion for for later on. So so far we want to keep it as possible. And and I guess uh, one thing that will be growing in the next years is is, is the data database itself. So as it grows, uh, you will actually be able to hit more and more shapes. So so mm -hmm. this means I guess also uh, 
what I wanted to, to, to just add on, on the markets, like you can clearly visualize when you when you come to the one thing you need to actually to understand is is it this is not like a two D um, volume that you're moving through. It's it's a three D space. So it means like uh, right right here, like when you pull the marker to the to the the edge, you can see kind of like the border being visualized. It means like beyond that there is no data, but you need to keep in mind that that what I, what I said. So this is a three D space, which means like uh, it, it, if this is just a simplified, I guess, representation, the the, the like the more in depth uh, representation will be a convex hull. So each point uh, on this marker it has like a dis distinct, dis distinctive like three D shape, which which describes where all the points from the database are. So so just keep that in mind while you're playing uh, to kind of like you know you know take all the all the uh, access into account because like you're essentially moving through the volume and searching the data within it yeah but but going back to the the uh, the, the having the sort of like those boundaries off I, I i don't think for now that that would be an option yeah we, we found when we were testing during development that you could sort of we, we played with a few different options for moving past and you can make faces that look quite interesting but then as soon as they animate they break um, I think that's one of the big yeah. challenges is is it's the rig because this is not just making a neutral it is it is building a whole rig in in real time with all the different movements that that comes with that when you start pushing outside where the data is you start you can get some very odd things with the the rig and we thought that would just be frustrating for people that you'd make the face that you thought was great and then it breaks down as soon as it animates and I wanted to mention just about we've talked about the database so much so the database itself, another one of the reasons why it's in the cloud, um, you, it's not possible for you to create a, a person that was observed by the mm -hmm. scanner in the database. So every metahuman, all the presets, anything you make, you don't need to, to use it in a game or something. You don't need to you know, pay a likeness license or anything like that. Um, also for like GDPR, for like privacy laws and stuff, there's there's no way to create uh, one of the inputs in the database using the outputs. Um, so that's just a good thing to know for anybody who you keep hearing us talk about scanning inputs and people for the database and observe noses and things like that. Let's see, next question comes from 813 South, who's wondering, and I wanted to t talk a, a bit about this a little bit in general. The, the question is, can I still use Reolution characters for Unreal? And I just wanted to clarify that it by no means with us releasing MetaHuman Creator, are we disallowing the use of uh, any other uh, software or, or models or assets that you import in, into Unreal Engine. There's absolutely zero requirement or plans to make MetaHuman the only um, character creator that you're allowed to um, use in Unreal Engine. Yes. Um. <laughs> Sorry, I was finding my mute button. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you can definitely still use those characters. That's that's absolutely fine. Um, you can even have them in the same scene as a meta human <laughs> if you wanted, but they might look quite different. The next question comes from L. Professor Wolf, who's wondering how long did the did the development of the meta human application take, and how many people were involved. Oh, wow. That is a hard question. I know Chris and Alex probably can talk about, I mean, like he said, like Chris said at the beginning, this is based on technology and ideas that 3 have been developing for a long time. So they can probably talk more about that. Yeah, well, I think, I don't know, Chris, like uh, the, 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 the conceptual, conceptualization that we have and everything, I think it's like, is it two years maybe or, or more than that? Well, you guys have been working on the pipeline to really um, using all of the knowledge you have over, you know, over ten years of rigging faces. What's what's the way that we can rig faces the fastest? And given a new, you know, a new vision for a character in a game or something, make that face or get that face and make a rig for it as fast as possible. Um, but that was really the secret sauce. That was the core. You know, rig logic was one of the core. IP is one of the core things of three lateral as a company. So the kind of turning point was talking about, well, going from the best, you know, content creators for animated faces in the world to 
using our core secret sauce and giving it away to everybody in the world for free with MetaHuman Creator, that was a bit uncomfortable because it's the, the company over the years um, has has focused on doing this really, really well. And by kind of releasing MetaHuman Creator and, and working, uh, joining Epic, it really, it really said like, okay, we're going to focus on making a system that allows anybody to do this and really democratizes. And, and that was a couple years ago, we talked about uh, yeah, the total two democratization. Years. <clears throat> and in terms of size of the team, again, it's really hard to sort of say exactly. I mean, we've had, you know, a core group of developers working on this product for a while. And then, um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, when you start taking into account all the people working on, like Chris said, the huge effort in clothing yeah. And you know all the grooms we did for the hair, and then the LODs for those grooms. But then when you also think about people working on the engine team who've worked on the groom technology, or who've worked on um, the animating an engine, you know the, the fact that we can build these rigs for these characters that when you download them, they have a fully animatable rig. You know it's really been a cross team effort. Also, we've had people working on the back end systems and adding the support for Quixel Bridge, and you know it's really been. Um, a huge collaboration between different parts of, of Epic to, to do this. So I think it would be very hard to draw a line and say, this is the team. We've been hugely grateful for the help we've got across the company, but um, a lot of folks have worked very hard across a lot of disciplines. I think it'd be a very hard product to make anywhere other than Epic, just because of that depth of, of uh, experience. Thank you all. Next question comes from Game Dev Onion, who's wondering. I apologize if this has already been answered, but um, video and animation production. Do we own the IP for video production with MetaHumans? So you'll have to check the EULA language exactly, but um, the MetaHuman assets themselves, um, Epic owns those, and you have the right to use those. Um, I think anything on top of that is then yours, but I'm I'm not a lawyer, so I I, I can't advise you there. <laughs> Next question comes from Autumn Palfanier. Hi, Autumn. I actually know this. I used to work with this person. Nice to see. Um, when will we be able to import saved Live Link face performance CSV files? Or potentially, is this something we've thought of? Uh. The CS, I guess you mean the CSVs that are saved to the phone if you're not streaming into the engine and recording. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure. I believe those were originally saved to the device to be for debugging and uh, I think loading into packages to debug what was going on. Um, to load, sometimes I can see you would probably want to record directly to the phone because then you're not beholden to latency or um, anybody that's using live link you may know that when the frame rate drops we kind of uh, record data at a different um, at that rate so yeah that's a good one that I can I can ask to the live link team live link face team and get back uh, in some fashion through Victor um, yep so that'd be recording data onto the phone copying that data into the onto your computer and importing it into the engine in some, some way. Next user has a username that I won't read the entire thing because it's CRXB16F15H. Okay, that wasn't too difficult. It's asking, have you noticed in terms of performance or is there recommendation for the best browser or best practices to use while working with MetaHuman Creator? So. I mean, performance-wise in the browser, I think we've seen pretty good results across the board. Like, I haven't seen too many people struggling with it. I, I know in certain regions, like, depending on where you are in the world, you might have a few connectivity problems. But um, sadly, that is just dependent on where you are in the world. In terms of best browser, like, I think we, we recommend Chrome on Windows, but I, we do support a few others as well. Check one. All right, there are. Sorry, my computer just went slow for a moment. Can you all hear me? OK, cool. I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, Kohako is wondering, are there, uh, are there any terms except the EULA that has to be applied? Um, we have a game for PlayStation 4. Can we just start using it? 
I'm not sure I understand the question. I believe they're curious if they're allowed to start um, using metahumans in Unreal Engine oh, in, pro in, yeah. in production. Yes, yes. I think they're, they're yeah, Based, as long as you're kind of within the terms of the EULA, you can use them in production for sure. And do let us know how you get on, because you know, we want to make this work for that kind of thing. Forums, good place Forums. for feedback. Forums. Yes. Um, Sidian is wondering, could you show us uh, or um, write documentation on how to properly export metahuman animation made in Maya back to Unreal Engine? Chris, is that something yes. you prepared earlier? Uh, yes, there. Yes, we have. There should. There is documentation. Um, we can. We can post that through through Victor, but basically, um, it really depends uh, whether it's body or face. So you may have noticed in the engine that there's two different scale meshes. Um, if if you're animating the face in Maya, you will um, there is a selection set in Maya, and um, actually, I mean, I've got it up right now. I was going to be doing a little demo, but uh, we're getting a, we've had such a good time watching Alex. Do you guys want to pop over and I can show? What I'm talking about? Yeah, let's go. Give us just a sec here. You're good to go. So, um, this is, uh, I think, Hudson, and this is just the source file that you'll get. Um, here you have body joints. Whoops, that's just my Maya. Um, so, there's body joints and there's face controls. If you select the controls in the facial control selection set, that is going to select all of the facial controls. Uh, my callback is going to pop up here. But um, so if I select all of these controls here, it's selecting all of the facial controls. And um, you know, James had mentioned the awesome work that the team has been doing on making animating an engine easier and better. Um, the metahumans are one of the first characters where uh, you, you export your sparse keyframe data on the animation controls, the same controls you use as an animator. You save those out as an FBX, and then you import those into Sequencer in the engine. Uh, you do that by right-clicking your rig in the engine, and you say import animation, and that's in Sequencer. So it actually does not use the traditional FBX import options, dialog, and things like that. This is really importing rig animation directly into Sequencer and um, it supports sparse keyframes like you had in Maya. Uh, for the body, you would go, and it's this other selection set that I pointed to earlier, and this has all of the export joints because there are multiple skeletons, um, and I've hidden this for now, but and I've turned off joints. So there's multiple skeletons. There's a driving skeleton, and there's an export skeleton. So by selecting these joints, these are all of the joints that are in the export skeleton. And when you export those through to the engine, uh, that's how you will get um, the body animation to come in. And um, once those animations are in, you, you can plop the body animation directly into Sequencer and import your facial animation onto that. And I hope that, um, I hope that kind of covers the, the question, but that's why those two selection sets are there to make it easier for you. Um, if you are exporting with FBX, uh, kind of a handy little thing is if you scroll down to the bottom of the import options, turn off inputs. Um, if you turn off exporting inputs, it won't traverse the entire DAG or Maya graph. And it'll just export the animated controls that you want. If you leave import, input um, inputs on, it'll try to pull like most of your Maya file into that FBX, and it just wastes everybody's time. <laughs> it just wastes your time when you go to export. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, Chris, was that it in terms of what you were planning to show from your end? Um, I can show some stuff in UE4. So I've got that character here in UE4. Just let me know if we're back to my screen. Yeah, you're good. Um, so <laughs> DMCA Sorry, strike that. hammer comes right now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so. As you can see uh, here, we've got the face and the body. If you drag a character into Sequencer, um, it then the character then uh, 
the the rigs pop in. So this is one of the another thing that the team, uh, the control rig team added, and the animation and engine team added. That's really awesome. Is the ability to when you just drag your character into sequencer, the scale mesh now knows like, hey, what is my rig, and it automatically adds the proper rig for you. Um, another thing that is not so known is that if you go into the content browser and you look under metahumans, common, common, and utilities, we merge so many different file structures together. That's why there's two common folders. But there's a metahuman picker here. And our animators really enjoy using pickers. And this is kind of a picker where you select uh, which metahuman uh, you want to use because you could have multiple in the scene. And then you can come in and use that as you would a normal picker. It's also a really, really awesome example of the power of editor utility widgets. Uh, Jared Monson on our team was able to make this picker uh, using editor utility widgets and I think the, the sequencer scripting lib. And it just really shows how you can make your own really awesome UIs using um, utility widgets in, in the engine. And this picker allows you to kind of make large selections of entire hands and things, um, you know, flip IK to FK, um, a lot of the different rigging features that Riam Tulan had created with, uh, she, she created the metahuman rig that you see here uh, in the engine. But, yep. Thank you, Chris. We're getting close to the end of the stream here. And so I wanted to let everyone know that your questions have been awesome. Really appreciate them. Um, if you have more and you would like to continue the conversation, head over to the forum announcement post for this live stream, as well as the metahuman category on uh, forums.unrealengine.com. Um, let me do a quick glance before I completely get away from my question notes here. Mm. A lot of duplicate questions. I should say I've seen a lot of questions that came in at the end of the, the stream that we've covered earlier on. So make sure that you go ahead and watch the, the VOD. As soon as we go offline, it will be available on both YouTube and Twitch. Um, with that, I should also mention that a transcript is usually a, will always be made available, but it is usually available within a week of, uh, of the live stream. Uh, we do a manual one. And so in case you're looking for any terminology, et cetera, you can go ahead and download that transcript, control F, look for it. We, it has a timestamp. Great way to go back and study the, uh, the live streams that we do here. Um, are, is there anything else from Alexander, Chris, James, Nina that you would like to cover? I don't think so. There's been some great questions. I think that's given us a chance to talk about a lot of stuff. I, I think we yeah we we've, we've we've covered quite a lot today. I, I I think the only thing is like beyond questions like if you do want to see more content around clothing and grooms and stuff like let us know what kinds of things you want to mm. see. Um, we would love to kind of see what you want, um, and we can try and plan around that. But for so much of this project, I mean Nina and all of us have been in these conversations of like well maybe people want this and maybe people want that. You know, I, it's been it's very hard because like like I said earlier, this doesn't exist really anywhere before and so there's going to be people using this that we just haven't even thought of so it's great to move past the point of like well maybe and and into it where we can actually hear from people so we, we really want to hear from people yeah and we obviously we obviously want to add tons more to the tool and, and we will do over time so i think obviously we, we've got a fairly limited set of clothing right now and, and some other bits as well but um as we increase that like obviously we'll we'll try and keep our range in mind as well so um, we're hitting a lot of lot of different marks there as well. I would like to thank you all for coming on the stream, but I'm not going to let you go just yet. I do want to let everyone out there uh, know that if you are interested in game development, video production for architectural visualizations, Unreal Engine is the tool for you. And you can go to unrealengine.com to download it for free. If you already have the Epic Games launcher, it is available in the Unreal Engine tab. You can go ahead and go get 426.2, which is the latest version of Unreal. It's right there. If you are more familiar with the use of GitHub, the engine uh, releases, as well as the master branch, is available on GitHub. You can go there and download the source, compile it yourself. Um, you'll see some of the latest and greatest and potentially unstable versions of the engine in the master branch. But if you go to the tag se section and pick release, that's where you get the same version that we are uh, shipping as a binary version on the Unreal Engine launcher. Um, I already mentioned the transcript, good way to uh, catch up and learn some of the terminology. In about a week, you can just turn on the captions on YouTube. Uh, that's the place to go for those. 
Um, make sure that you let us know how we did today on the stream. We're going to go ahead and paste a survey in chat. Um, let us know what you think of the stream and what future topics you would like to see us cover, whether that's more metahumans or something else. Um, we also do have the entire playlist of Inside Unreal episodes available on YouTube. You can also find it in all of the future, some of the past and all of the future forum announcement posts on our forums. Um, there are no physical meetups going on around the world right now because of the pandemic, but uh, some of the community groups are hosting virtual meetups using Discord and other various tools. Uh, if you're curious about getting in touch with more people uh, that are using Unreal Engine, go ahead and head over to communities.unrealengine.com. If there's no local meetup group in your area and you're interested in becoming a organizer, there's also a little button that lets you send a form to us that we will go over. Uh, so if that's something that you're interested in, feel free to go ahead and get in touch with us. Um, if you're interested in information or anything else, updates when it comes to MetaHuman, uh, most of that will be released on our forums as well as our Twitter accounts. We also have a Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. Um, there's also an unofficial Discord community known as Unreal Slackers. Uh, it is great for real-time conversations. They have channels for everything, past 50,000 members. Uh, some of our most uh, active community contribu contributors are there. It's a great place to hang out. Just go to unrealslackers.org. Um, there's also a lounge channel if you just want to talk you know, everything not Unreal with people who like Unreal. Uh, that's a situation I find myself in a lot of times. I like hanging out with game developers. Who'd have thought? Um, we do highlight community spotlights every week. If you want to uh, suggest your project for one of those, you can get in touch with us through any of our channels I previously mentioned. Uh, you can also go ahead and send an email to community at unrealengine.com. We monitor that email closely. Um, we have a countdown video that we do every week. This is gener generally 30 minutes of development that's sped up to five minutes. Uh, but we've seen some really good contributions lately that completely went away from that format. So. Just go ahead and submit anything that's five minutes long, um, and we will take a look, and potentially you might be one of our countdowns that we put in the loop. Uh, if you stream on Twitch, make sure that you add the Unreal Engine tag as well as the game development tag. Maybe not if you're doing something in terms of virtual production, but the Unreal Engine tag is important, and that way other creators who are interested in live content uh, using Unreal Engine can go ahead and find you. Uh, like I said, make sure you follow us on social media for all news. Hit that notification bell on YouTube if you want to see when we go live, as well as all of the other non-live um, videos that we release to YouTube. There's some cool stuff being prepared by the evangelists. They've been doing a lot more uh, video con content during the pandemic, and so it's exciting to see. Um, next week, next week, I remember what we have next week because I, I was going to show. Next week, Alexander Pascal is coming on the stream, and he's going to cover a little bit more in depth of some of the learning, uh, one of the learning videos he did on Googly Eyes. He hasn't responded to me in the last couple of days, so I really hope he's still on board because uh, I'm excited to get him back on the stream. It's been a while, and I'm sure all of you who know who he is uh, would be excited to have him back as well. With that said, I would like to thank uh, Alexander, Chris, James, and Nina for taking the time out of the day to come here to talk a little bit about MetaHuman Creator. Um, chat, please give it up for our guests today um, and, uh, and wish them well or... Um, you know, give them, give them, give them whatever you want to write in chat. It doesn't really matter. I know some people say give once in chat, give twos. I don't care. Whatever you want to say, let them know that you appreciate them coming on the stream today. Uh, with that said, is there anything else y'all want to cover? No, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thanks, Alex, for doing such awesome art while we've been waffling. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Enjoying that. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I was uh, less, uh, I guess, verbal at that point, but I think. Uh, you guys can like shoot any questions that that, that you feel like uh, uh, it would be good to 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 cover, and I think we we could we could uh, arrange also like a video where I can maybe uh, uh, record uh, and, and give a more in depth. Uh, I, I found it a little bit difficult to, to like talk and, and work at the same time, uh, but but yeah, like I, I think we can we can do something if 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 you feel that uh, you need any any more info on the on the tool itself. And as always, with um, whether they're plugins or new features in Unreal Engine that come out in early access. Since we are still actively developing them, it is uh, relatively rare that we produce sort of in-depth uh, documentation, tutorials, or learning content on those tools specifically. So do expect more of that in the future um, alongside the uh, MetaHuman being MetaHuman creator uh, maturing and becoming more of the full-fledged tool that the developers are planning it to be. With that said, I want to thank everyone for watching today. Hope you're staying safe out there, and we will see you again next week at the same time. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.